Welcome to Financial Issues, where we join reality with truth, helping you make the most of your money by honoring God with your investments. Now listen in as we give you the practical tools and advice you need to become a biblically responsible investor. Good Wednesday morning. Today is September the 11th, 2024. And we want to start the show a little bit differently today. We do want to, um, you know, start in remembrance of what happened in this country um, on September the 11th, 2001. Uh, it was a day that I think most of us would remember, uh, remember where we were <laughs> when all of those uh, terrible things began happening in our country. And uh, I remember where I was. I was in my in my living room getting ready to head out to work. Um, I worked as a financial advisor in the financial industry, and I was just stopped and just stunned by what I was seeing on the television, the, the planes hitting the towers, the towers beginning to fall. And I remember going to work that day and just uh, really kind of staying glued. The, the phones were surprisingly kind of quiet. I guess everything everybody was doing the same thing that I was, just watching and um, reflecting and you know, thinking about um, how grateful I was that that I wasn't in that part of the country, and just praying for the people who were just experiencing those horrific events. Seth, where were you? Yeah, Shannon, it was interesting. I was eight at the time, and I didn't really understand it fully. Uh, I, I remember I was homeschooled, and so we were starting our day of school, and uh, my mom turned on the TV around you know nine o'clock or so in the morning and sure enough the the towers were burning at that point i do remember seeing the south tower getting struck live and then mm -hmm. seeing the replays mm -hmm. of it um and honestly you know i didn't really understand it much at the time but i did know even as an eight-year-old that something was seriously wrong and yeah. it was really bad you know and it's it's taken i think years even to process that you know but yeah. understanding just what a dark day it was for our country i mean what a it terrible was. tragic day it was. You know, following the attack, though, we saw America come together. We saw fundraisers happen. We saw, you know, uh, people gathering together in public places all around the country praying. Um, you know, it's not like today where we see Americans that are just so divided on every single issue. And, uh, you know, my prayer would be, you know, we, we touched on this in the, a little bit in yesterday's show, just about, you know, the best place to start is at home. Um in our own hearts is, is to look into our own hearts. And so America needs a wake up call. America needs to, to realize that the reason that we have, that we're experiencing the kind of uh, judgment, right out judgment, outright judgment in this country is because of the decisions that we've made collectively as a society. And so, you know, we need to repent. We, we need to focus and make sure that our walk is blameless so that we can be good examples to those around us. And uh, speaking of walking a path, our stewardship verse today comes from Psalm 23, 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That is a, a really great uh, instruction on what we are to do now and uh, a good reminder of what is to come. Seth, what did you Amen, mean? Shannon. Yeah, you know, th this verse does have something to do with the history of 9-11 as well. Uh, it's appropriate to read this verse because it was one of the verses that was quoted by the brave Christian passengers on Flight 93. Right before they tried to take back control of the plane, uh, they did succeed in crashing it into a field uh, in central Pennsylvania, I believe it was. Um, and so they quoted this verse along with the Lord's Prayer right before uh, taking that courageous stand, knowing that they were going to lose their lives. Mm -hmm. You know, Shannon, to dwell in the house of the Lord is to be near Him and to experience His presence. And there is nothing better than this. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it, it only comes when we place our faith in Him. And as we've been talking today and yesterday about needing uh, just a complete 180 turn of repentance in this country, that is a good prayer for us, that we as a nation uh, would come back to the presence of the Lord and that we would experience His grace. Uh, may it be so. Mm, amen. Yep. Yeah. Well, Shanna, uh, as the as we're kind of talking about, it's actually kind of interesting that this is our topic of the day, uh, because I think there were similar questions being asked 23 years ago after the events of 9-11. But the question is this, is the economy doomed and what do we do about it? 
So we might need to preach this verse to ourselves more than we <laughs> think we do, especially as we consider the uh, current economic climate. So I'll just start there, Shanna. Is the economy doomed in your opinion? Are there tough times ahead considering, again, we've talked about overvaluing the market, political instability, rising of our national debt, way above $35 trillion now. Uh, how do we make sense of this? Well, the short answer is yes. And I would say refer to revelations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> That's going to yeah. tell you all that you need to know about that. But, you know, it is a it is a spiritual problem. And the way that we got here was by taking our eyes off of Jesus. You know, we have um, as a nation, we've taken God out of all of the, the public square. We've taken the Ten Commandments down out of the courthouses. We've kicked God out of schools, banning prayer in schools and you know, all of those kind of things. And so, you know, we're left to the consequences of that. And, you know, as a nation, it's a, it's a spiritual problem. It's not an economic problem. It has manifested in economic ways, you know, some of the ways that, that we're seeing uh, things happen. But it is a spiritual problem. And, and you know, that's, that's how we got here by um, becoming wise in our own eyes, thinking that the Bible, that God's Word is antiquated and that it doesn't apply to modern times and um, thinking that uh, we are progressive, that we are going to uh, progress on our own ideas, that we're going to, that we're basically good and we're just going to get better by the ideas that we have to make society better when the reality is the exact opposite. Human, human beings are born sinful and flawed, and we need a savior if we if we are to have any hope. So, we hope that you have found that hope in Jesus Christ. And if you haven't, then we encourage you to go to our website. Yes, a financial issues website <laughs> where we talk a lot about uh, the economics and market and things like that. But the most important piece of information on our website is in the resources tab where it says, "Do you want to know God?" That is the answer to all of our problems. Um, including our economic problems. From a practical standpoint, though, you know, where we stand right now, the if we want to focus in on something, it's spending. You know, spending is our biggest problem. It's just, you know, math doesn't work. I don't care if we have common core, we become wise in our own eyes. We've, we've you know, talk about how two plus two doesn't necessarily have to equal four. And if it does, it's probably racist. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's the logic, though. That's right. <laughs> it is. I mean, it's just, it's absolute silliness that, um, you know, has, has taken over the country. But, you know, even the Biden administration just admitted that the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, remember how it was called the Inflation Reduction Act because inflation was around 9% at the time and we really needed a solution. So, you know, the Green New Deal, he finally admitted that the Green New Deal basically was just repackaged and relabeled the Inflation Reduction Act so that it could uh, get passed. And it unleashed, uh, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, Tom. no, I was going to say yes and amen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it was basically repackaged and relabeled all of the things that, uh, you know, the left thought we needed to save yeah. the earth from global warming was uh, just repackaged as something that would solve the problem of inflation. Even the CHIPS Act, you know, so there was all of this spending. There was the COVID stimulus spending. There was the Inflation Reduction Act. There was the CHIPS bill. Uh, there was something like... I think it was like seven trillion dollars of spending that was done in that very short time, short period of time that was just really accelerated. Uh, I was watching an interview this morning from I can't remember his name, but he was uh, in the Trump administration and he was talking about how he was in favor and he was he was leading the push for the Chips Act, which was you know. Uh, put forth under the Biden administration, but he said, you know, what we were asking for, um, that it was a, a national security issue that we were getting all of our chips, you know, from out of the country, our, um, our uh, you know, as far as technology goes, and that we needed to onshore some of that, and we needed to, you know, to have that made in America. He said, we were asking for $50 billion. The CHIPS Act got passed, and it ended up getting passed at $500 billion. And they didn't just accidentally put an extra zero at on the end. The other $450 billion was for other stuff that wasn't related in the least 
to what the title of the act was was the, was the, the Chips Act, but you know, in his his uh, in defense of that, he said it was so important from a national security standpoint to get that fifty billion dollars that we needed that it was worth passing the other four hundred and fifty billion dollars worth of junk that was in it, and so you know, it's just the Democrats are really um, they have a a Keynesian. Uh, economic philosophy, which is to pour money into the hands of the middle class because they know that they will consume. They will spend the money. And it seems to make sense a little bit at first because we are a consumer-driven economy. And so you think about where the, the money actually goes. Um, you know, the government, and you think about where the government gets their money. So Republicans are more likely to invest that money in something that's going to generate more supply rather than just use it all. Hear the music. We got to take a break. Don't go anywhere. We're going to come back with more financial issues right after this. If you don't get life right, you're not going to get all the other issues correct, period. It is the issue that impacts every other issue. Life is the central part of what keeps this republic together. It is the contract that the founding fathers passed down through multiple generations. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You don't have life, you don't have a republic. There is a temptation out there right now. And I want to just tell you we must resist it. There's this temptation that we cast this issue aside. How does that honor God? It doesn't. And if it wasn't for preborn, I would be super just confused and depressed because there has never been, in my opinion, a more disjointed time in the pro-life movement. We need a machine to go up against the Planned Parenthood beast. Like we have to play offense against the pro-abortion forces in this country, okay? We have to play offense. And Freeborn does it in this compassionate, merciful, godly way that is just so inspiring and amazing. Navigating through investment options can be challenging, especially when you're determined to uphold your God-given values. Every dollar you invest is a vote for the world that you want to live in. Let your values guide your investment decisions and help to shape the culture in which we live. Become a beacon of light and pave the way with biblically responsible investing. Timothy Plan, where faith and finance collide. Before investing, carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company. This and other important information can be found in the fund's prospectus. To obtain a copy, visit timothyplan.com or call 800-846-7526. Read each perspective carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. Welcome back to Financial Issues on this September the 11th, 2024. We are remembering um, what happened in this country on September the 11th, 2001. So I would just encourage you to pray, to to seek the Lord, to ask for uh, the comfort of those who continue to grieve the losses that they experienced those 23 years ago, and to pray for our leaders. You know, I know we, we sort of poke fun um, you know, and roll our eyes at, at what's the shenanigans that are happening in Washington all the time. But uh, we need to do what the Bible says, and we need to be praying for our leaders. We need to be praying that uh, conviction would come upon them, that they would um, seek the wisdom of the Lord and the direction of this country that the Lord wants to take it in, that we would be um, a handmaiden for the Lord, and that we would we would be active and alive in the work that the that the Lord is doing in the end times, because they are certainly upon us. Um, also, continue to pray today um, as uh, uh, Hurricane Francine is going to be making its way uh, upon shore today. So, um, my area I think is pretty safe, but um, the storm is coming in just to the just to the west of me, and one of our analysts lives near Lafayette. So, uh, keep him and his family in prayer for for uh, as they weather the storm. Well, uh, to pick up on the topic right before the break there, we were talking about 
uh, economic philosophy of Democrats versus Republicans. And, you know, the Democrats really ascribe to more of a, a Keynesian economic philosophy. You hear Joe Biden talk a lot about building back America, uh, building back better uh, from the middle out and the bottom up. So his plan is to use the money that the government collects from taxpayers and put it into the hands of consumers. And like I said, it seems like that would work since we are a consumer-driven economy, but it doesn't work when you just spend everything that you have. And as we're seeing now, there's a disparity happening between lower-income consumers and higher-income consumers. So most of that COVID stimulus money that was pumped into the economy is now gone, and inflation has been the result. And now the lower-income a segment of the population is really being hurt badly by inflation. So the flip side of that and the reason that I gravitate toward more Republican policies is because Republicans are typically more pro-business. They're pro-investment. They're pro-productivity. Um, They're uh, in favor of getting rid of a lot of regulations that are happening um, in our economy. And, you know, you look at the situation right now, we're looking at seeing um, U.S. steel potentially being purchased by the Japanese, a Japanese company. And, you know, you just look around and you wonder, well, how did we, how did we even get there? Well, I mean, it's a result of not things that have just happened in the last few years. I mean, it's things that have, it's the way that our country has evolved, evolved um, from a philosophical standpoint over the last, you know, several decades as we've looked to government to be the solution for everything, to be the solution for economics, to be the, the solution for homelessness and poverty and, you know, all of those things. And, you know, the more that you rely on, on a, an entity, for your well-being, the more you have to give over control of resources. So for the government to be able to do all of the things that people are asking it to do, it has to have money to do that. And so, you know, we just, you know, I think we have to really seek biblical wisdom about, you know, what we're supposed to be doing from a stewardship standpoint to be taking care of ourselves, to be taking care of our families, to be active and giving in our churches so that churches can take care of community needs so that it doesn't fall on the government because the government does a really bad job in appropriating money. I mean, it's just, uh, it, it, it's ridiculous. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how I tie my um I guess not necessarily my politics, but my economics to, to biblical principles. <laughs> yeah, no, that's really good, Shanna. And what advice would you give us if we're maybe fearful of messiness in the economy, chaos in the economy? How do we invest well in spite of the chaos? Well, you know, messiness and chaos is not a new concept in the markets. Yeah. The markets yeah. and the economy have always been messy and chaotic at best. Just from my experience, I started my my career in the uh, investment industry in 1999. So, you know, just going back, I can think of there's there's always been a time when in when investors had an excuse or a reason to be afraid. In 1999, it was Y2K. Remember Y2K? Um, all of the computers were supposed to crash because of some code that was inherently flawed in the in the systems, and we were going to have blackouts and no electricity, and people were, um, you know, storing up food and and different things like that. Well, it didn't happen. Um, you know, then we had 9/11. The markets did drop. Uh, really sharp and really fast, but they also recovered. Um, fast forward a little bit, we had uh, 2000 and the fin great financial crisis 2007 through 2009, and that was you know the S and P 500 over uh, uh, I think it was an 18 month period dropped by 53 percent, and it still took you know uh, a couple of years for the S and P 500 to even recover. 
Um, you know, then you then you fast forward. We've had COVID. We've had we've had all kind of things. You know, and and every year we've had all kind of wars. We had Ukraine. We've had what's going on in the Middle East. We've had the just numerous things that you can think of. So there's not a time when people aren't afraid of what's happening in the world around us. You know, and I think that's that's why the Bible. Uh, says so many times it repeats over and over to us do not be afraid be of good courage keep your eyes focused on Jesus don't don't be focused on the things that are happening in the world trust the Lord um, you know to help you navigate through all of these things mm-hmm. yeah well said Shannon I appreciate that last question here how do we as a nation right the ship in the economy what's the the antidote to this current situation well the first thing that has to happen is we have to get a, a con- control over spending in this country, and I yeah. just I just don't even know if that that's even possible. So much of the spending that is done in our government right now has to be done. You know, Social Security has to be funded, um, Medicare has to be funded. We have to defend our country. That's the you know that's a, a legitimate reason for our government to exist. Uh, defense of the country, infrastructure, protection of the citizens. Those are the things that, uh, those are the reasons that we do have government and they do exist. So we, we need to, you know, as a country, get a, a, a get re-educated or a new revelation of what government is actually supposed to be and then force a reduction of government spending, um, whatever that looks like. So, you know, I personally, um, would like to see a, a a Trump administration. Actually, I would like to see what I what I really want to see is Elon Musk get into the position of cutting out the waste in the government. You know, I think Elon Musk was born in South Africa, so he he could never be president. But you know, having him be an unelected bureaucrat might be just what we need. <laughs> you know, to see him cut out the waste, and I hope that if he does. Uh, get the job. I hope he walks in on his first day with a kitchen sink, just like he did to Twitter. I mean, uh, you know, look at what he did with Twitter. I mean, Twitter got out of control on this, you know, left leaning um, on its left leaning philosophies. And it had just a ton of fat that needed to be cut. And, you know, I personally think that the Twitter that we have today is better than the Twitter that we had three years ago. Um, And it it wasn't, you know, it wasn't easy, but I mean, Elon Musk had vision. He he saw what needed to be done, and that's one of the things that needs to be done uh, in our country. It needs to be treated like a business, and, um, you know, there needs to be accountability. So, you know, there will always be these pockets of opportunity that you hear us talk about. You know, uh, about a month ago, we took most things off of our buy list. Um, because we just we saw some things that were concerning happening in the economy that we know is going to impact the markets. The markets are very forward looking. Um, usually, they I think they've kind of missed some of the things that have snuck up just because the numbers that we um, look at to get a gauge on how the economy is doing have just been sort of uh, you know flawed or or uh, appear to to be better or painted in a better light than than what they are. And so, you know, um, but even in those times, there were still some things that we left on the buy list. Um, there weren't any um, equities, so to speak, but there were still pockets of opportunity. There's always going to be pockets of opportunity. So if you're a partner now, you can kind of read between the lines and you can see that in our strategy by what's on our buy list and what's not on our buy list. So, you know, for example, we think that falling interest rates are going to help um, real estate um, as as rates come down. So you're going to see some things on the buy list. You're going to see quite a few things in financials. You're going to see um, REITs. Uh, we think that small businesses are eventually going to be helped. We think that that's going to take a little bit of time to filter through the economy. But, you know, I'd rather be... Um, Further ahead on some things than than behind, so it may it may take some time for those strategies to filter out and play through. But you know, um, energy uh, the energy sector is in a little bit of a slump right now, and there are some exceptional opportunities. And so, uh, at least one of the companies that we put on the buy list yesterday was for that reason uh, alone. AI is still a trend. 
Um, the opportunity is not going to be only exclusive to NVIDIA. NVIDIA is not the only AI play. AI will take lots of energy. So you're going to see some things in the utility sector um, are there because of that trend. Falling interest rates is going to make it hard to get a good return on fixed income. So we've already made some adjustments there. I mean, even if uh, Comrade Kamala takes <laughs> office, you know, there's still going to be some pockets of opportunity. Um, they certainly won't be the same pockets of opportunity that we would see under a Trump administration. And they certainly um, probably won't be as lucrative or profitable as the things that might happen under a Trump administration. But uh, there will still be some things uh, that we can do. And uh, we'll continue to look for those pockets of opportunities trying to be uh, discerning of the time. So pray as you would. Uh, as Ian always used to ask that we would be found as sons and daughters of Issachar with a special understanding of the times. Well, um, if you're listening on an outlet that only carries the short version of the show, we have to wish you a farewell today. But we hope that you're going to come back tomorrow because Lord willing, we'll be here with more financial issues. For the rest of you, stay tuned. We've got more financial issues today. Investing is about so much more than money. It's a way we can provide a better future for our loved ones and make a greater impact for the things that matter most to us. Good stewardship is investing in things that last for eternity and not things that go against biblical values. For over 25 years, Financial Issues has provided partners with the tools they need to build a portfolio that honors God and blesses others. Become a partner with Financial Issues today to see how you can steward your resources in a God-honoring way. Hi, this is Sheena Burt, the host of Financial Issues. The Financial Issues family is so blessed to have saved tens of thousands of babies, all thanks to the generous support of you, our listeners and viewers. For $140, you can sponsor five ultrasounds. Please go to preborn.org, that's preborn.org, or financialissues.org and click on the Preborn logo. Save a baby, save a life. As of this year, more than 1,000 school districts have adopted gender non-conforming policies that intentionally keep parents in the dark about their kids' gender identities. To make matters worse, the American Bible Society now reports Bible reading is at an all-time low. We can't hide from the issues facing our country anymore. The undeniable truth is we're in a culture war and we must be engaged. For over the last 25 years, Financial Issues has stood as a leader of biblically responsible investing, encouraging the body of Christ to keep funds out of companies that dishonor God. We call that defunding the darkness. We're at the forefront of the fight, helping you not only with your finances, but advocating for truth and godly wisdom. Run the race with us as we press forward together. For more information, go to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. Where's Mima? We found out Shepard's diagnosis when I was about 17 weeks pregnant. We learned that he was going to need a series of surgeries after he was born in order to give him what they considered a normal life. And we Just weren't sure how this very, worked. Yeah, yeah, very emotional, very, very broken. And as my wife just said, not sure how this worked. And we called Samaritan and they said, you, you just go have that baby. You leave the rest to us. And just to hear the confidence on the other end of the phone mm. of this is not something that you need to be concerned about at all. You focus on the health of your family, the health of your baby, and we will walk with you every step of the way. Securities offered through GA Reffel and Company, a registered broker, dealer, and investment advisor, member FINRA and SIPC. Opinions expressed by Shanna are hers alone and are for informational purposes only and do not necessarily represent those of GA Reffel or the outlet on which you are listening. You should consider how the information applies to your situation prior to personally implementing it and consult any financial professional you work with to make sure it's applicable to your financial plan. 
Welcome back to Financial Issues Today, everybody. Great to be here with you today. This is a somber day in our country's history, of course, but uh, grateful that you all have joined us today, and I hope you enjoyed our conversation in those first couple of segments there. There's a lot to talk about for the remainder of our show here, and of course, we'll get to that all. Uh, The big thing, of course, the debate last night, lots to digest from that, folks, but I think uh, to prioritize what's most important, I'd like to spend just a moment reminding you all uh, of this day 23 years ago, also hearing from our founder, Dan Celia, what this day meant to him as well. I asked many of you in the chat to share your experiences uh, with when you first found out about this attack on our country, and you heard me share mine earlier as well, but just wanted to remind you so that you would indeed never forget about the darkest day in our nation's history, and as dark as it was, also the tremendous courage that was exhibited, and patriotism as well, on that day and the days that followed. So, t- uh, 2,977 is the number. That's the number of innocent American citizens that were killed. That does not include the 19 murderers, the terrorists, the Islamists, Islamic conspirators uh, as as part of the conspiracy in the Middle East as well. The number is 2,977 innocent American lives were killed that day. So the terrorists hijacked four commercial flights in the U.S., crashed them into four targets. Those targets were the Twin Towers of New York City, the Pentagon in Washington, and an unknown fourth location. Many believe it was the U.S. Capitol building. Some also believe it might have been the White House. Uh, the majority of those innocent souls, as you know, were killed in Lower Manhattan that day in the Twin Towers, either by the fire caused by the explosions or the demolition collapse of the towers about an hour later. At 8.46 a.m., the North Tower was struck by American Airlines Flight 11. At 9.03 a.m. that morning, the South Tower was struck by United Airlines Flight 175. 9.37 a.m., the Pentagon was struck by American Airlines Flight 77. Then at right around 10 o'clock, the South Tower in New York City collapses. At 10.03, United Flight 93 crashed into Western Pennsylvania. By that point, the folks on that plane knew what was happening, and so they decided to do something about it, and they tried to take back control of the plane, uh, causing it to crash in a field in Western Pennsylvania. Then at 10.30, the North Tower collapsed, and then following that day was uh, incredible chaos and an attempt to rebuild and restore. That day, uh, 2,753 people were killed in New York City, 184 people were killed in Washington, D.C., and 40 were killed on Flight 93 in Western Pennsylvania. Right now, folks, I'd like to share some of the reflections of our founder, Dan Celia, on what this day meant to him. So here's a couple of clips of our founder, Dan Celia, and his words on September 11th. Do you remember, if you are old enough, the unity that, we all felt for several days after that as well. I was in a conference in my office that morning with a number of people. The meeting was over and I came out and of course we had a television uh, in our lobby because of the financial news and such. And there were people in our building uh, and and those that worked for us standing around the television. And I looked at the screen and I said, oh my word, what has gone on? They said a plane ran into the World Trade Center. And I said, wow, what what a horrible thing. And we were all thinking, and even on the news, that it was an accident, some kind of crazy accident. And then as we were sitting there watching and speaking, we saw the second plane coming in. It was, a, it was a moment that so many of you, and I know I will never, never forget. The silence in the lobby there where we were watching, you could have heard a pin drop. Nobody knew what to say or what to think. Maybe some murmurs of, you know, oh my God, what is going on? And... Um, it was then realized that it was a terrorist attack on our soil. And we didn't even understand then until the first building collapsed what the death toll was going to be. Then we hear about the Pentagon and, of course, uh, in Pennsylvania, Somerset. Those brave men and women who crashed the plane rather than go 
to you know, rather than die in the Capitol building. Apparently, that's where that plane was headed. There was a sense of unity that if you didn't actually see the unity of the American people at work, if you didn't actually see it, you felt it. It was so obvious. It was so strong. It was so powerful. And I said this morning on Twitter, oh, if we, without the tragedy, could see that unity again, it would be hard to imagine that anybody driving, anybody in America that day could be thinking about a divisiveness of rich versus poor, of black versus white, of Hispanic versus Asian, whatever the situation, it would be hard to believe on that day and the days following that there could be any divisiveness in an American's heart about any of those meaningless, senseless, idiotic thoughts, there wouldn't be any. Well said from our founder, Dan Celia. A couple more thoughts from Dan here I'd like to share with you all on remembering September 11th, 2001. 9-11 today. 9-11, and we saw the president had a moment of silence that he led uh, just a few minutes ago at the White House, and uh, certainly... Our prayers and hearts still go out to those, the lost loved ones that day. And this is a time that we remember the unity we had afterwards. How about we reflect on that as well? The incredible unity that we saw throughout the no nation. You know, I remember um, living, I, I live in the Philadelphia area, and I remember even on the roadways for weeks afterwards, there was a calmness and a sense of um, just um, in all of the, of the catastrophe. And <clears throat> it is just certainly something that uh, we should be glad that we live in America. And I think about these hurricanes and the unity that we have seen, we haven't, that we will see in Florida and that we've seen in Texas. Just amazing. And when America uh, gets, gets hurt, people come together in a, in a wonderful way. And Maybe, maybe it'll be contagious to Washington, D.C., that unity. But certainly it has been uh, nice to see, and I hope uh, today especially we can remember the unity that we felt around the flag uh, on this day, about this time, uh, the, when we were wondering what was going on. We all remember the specific time I was in a uh, conference. Uh, I was in a board meeting at the time uh, with my own board. And um, we had t we always have TVs on. I have TVs in my office with TVs in the lobby. And we were, um, I came out and somebody, uh, one of our employees that was watching the TV and said there has been an accident. And the, uh, a plane had flown into um, the first world Trade Center building, and we thought it was just that. We thought it was an accident. And as we were watching, we uh, watched the second plane. So what a tragedy it was. And I just remember being, I don't know, it was just uh, hit, hit us like a ton, ton of bricks. It was just what, you know, what was going on, and it was just amazing. And so certainly um, we remember that day and a lot of us remember where we are were and what we were doing uh, but incredible emotional day and a day of unity and um, a day that we remember God's hand of blessing upon this nation as uh, we are praying for those now and uh, know that um, that uh, hopefully this will be a time when people will draw closer to him Boy, that's the only appropriate prayer we can pray, folks. Um, very interesting to think about all this. Very interesting. And uh, it's not something that, um, it's, it's, it's not an easy thing to think about, uh, you know, honestly. 23 years later, uh, the aftershocks of this day have still been felt. 
uh, heightened tensions in the Middle East with our Islamic foes. Thousands of first responders who survived that day in the last two decades have fallen ill to various diseases from that day. Lung diseases, many of them have died. Uh, and sadly, in some ways, still no justice for the men who were involved in this mass murder, as many of them still remain imprisoned in Guantanamo Bay, uh, having not been given the death penalty. And I think one thing, and we'll have to maybe save these thoughts for the other side of the break here, folks, but a lot to think about here with 9-11, and I do hope that you take this day to reflect and to thank God for the country that he has given us, uh, and also for his sovereign hand of protection over us, and to pray for our country. Please do that. We'll talk more about this on the other side of the break. More financial issues right after this. In a world where financial decisions can feel overwhelming, it's easy to lose sight of what truly matters. But what if there is a way to align your financial goals with your deepest values? Financial Issues has helped us navigate the complex world of finance through a biblical lens. By prioritizing and investing in a way that honors God, Financial Issues has empowered us to focus on what truly matters, our family, our faith, and our future. With financial issues by our side, we can invest knowing that our financial decisions are in line with our values. Take the first step today and become a financial issues partner to access rich online resources, training tools, and guidance for biblically responsible investing. Head over to financialissues.org and learn how to invest your money in a way that honors God. That's financialissues.org. There are moments in life that define us. Choices determine the courses we take. Choices that create life. Or those that save the life. And some make life worthwhile. There are decisions to stay or to go. To remain the same or to grow. Sometimes we pray and make peace. Other times we take a stand for what we believe. In celebration, mourning, triumph, and defeat, we are invested in every decision we seek. Despite differences, we have one thing in common, the desire to do all for the glory of God. Keep your wallet aligned with your heart and your investments in harmony with your faith. Timothy Plan, Biblically Responsible Mutual Funds, ETFs, and Retirement Plans. Before investing, carefully consider a fund's investment objective, risks, charges, and expenses contained in the prospectus available at timothyplan.com. Read carefully before investing. The opinions and recommendations expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the opinions of the station or any of the program sponsors. Additionally, all products or services offered by the program sponsors may not be known by the program. You know, folks, today's a good day to join the FISM chat, financialissues.org slash live. Uh, obviously, lots to talk about in the chat, and it's busy as ever today. The two topics of conversation that are dominating the chat are the debate from last night, and of course, it being September 11th today, the 23rd anniversary of that attack on our country. I ended last segment uh, by trying to make some sense of what had happened and how we're feeling the aftershocks of this. And it's been 23 years, folks. You know, it's been almost a quarter century. A generation has gone by. Uh, there are many people who are adults now. In fact, I was just talking to one of them in the control room, Grant, uh, who was too young to remember even what had happened. Uh, but there are a whole lot of questions, folks, a whole lot of questions. And one of you in the chat, I think John had brought up uh, that 9-11 after that, the government gave us the Patriot Act. So sad for America. John, I could not agree with you more, brother. I think that was one of the most egregious examples. And we've seen this a lot, folks. Egregious examples of corrupt governments capitalizing on a tragic event to gain more power. And that's, and that's what it was. And I'm not saying that, you know, there weren't protections put in place against terrorist attacks, to be sure. But you do have to ask the question, well, who are the people who are labeled as terrorists in America today? Well, it's people like me and you. It's Christians, conservatives. We're called the terrorists now. So you have to wonder. The question has to be asked, how could something like this happen in the most powerful and prosperous nation on earth? And I do believe that the U.S. government 
owes us more answers than they have given us. Absolutely. And that's all I'll say right there in an effort to not go down a conspiracy rabbit trail, but simply to say that we deserve more answers from our government as the American people. Regardless of that, this day, and you know, the day may come where we have those answers, and I hope it does, but on a day like today, where we're at right now, the very worst of human evil, we've seen that laid before us, we have nowhere to turn, folks, except to one place, which is to fall at the feet of the Lord and to beg for his grace upon our nation. If you learned anything from last night's debate, you understand that we are at a point in our country right now where we need the sovereign hand of God to rescue us. We deserve a wicked uh, candidate. <laughs> and it's a sad thing to say, folks, it really is. But part of the judgment of God is handing over to people what their desires are. And as a country, we're a country that has routinely murdered children and mutilated children and opened up our borders and completely slain in the street the word of God. And so for God to hand us over to our desires is simply God giving us what we've wanted. And so we, as the remnant in this country, Christians, need to go on behalf of our country and pray that God would show the entire country grace that it does not deserve in keeping us from a truly wicked president. And there's much to be concerned with in this country, folks. There really is. But we need to take comfort that he will provide for those who call upon his name. The book of Second Chronicles says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear them from heaven. That's a great promise. And so we need to do that. The Christians need to do that. Not many people are praying for our country. The Christians need to be the ones to lead the charge there, folks. We really do. Well, we mentioned the debate. Many of you had your, uh, your things to share in the chat. I loved so many of them. I, I thought they were right on. I think, folks, here, here's the deal. I think the debate went about as expected. I don't think it's a surprise that Donald Trump is not only going up against Kamala Harris, but also against the entire established legacy media, as well as most of social media. Uh, we should not be surprised by this. This is the way that it's been. And this is the way that it will continue to be unless uh, we have a serious change of course. So I thought that that was about what we could take from the debate to be sure. Um, I, I do not, I'm not giving up on our country. And uh, I, I think that we need to continue to pray for this country and believe that God can turn us around and he has done so in the past. And so he can do it again. And so I'm excited for what could potentially come while also nervous to be sure. But I hope that that could make some sense. I, I know many times I speak as a fool. I'm a kid, I'm younger than a lot of you are. Uh, but I hope to be able to make some sense with the words that I have to say about this. Okay, let's get to the ag report now, folks. I know we've got some things to get to in the markets and the ag. Here's Craig Halgard with today's ag report, and then we'll talk a little bit more to end our show. This is Craig Halgard with your financial issues ag update for September 11th. A corn fell victim to the downside positioning ahead of Thursday's USDA report. Weekly crop conditions for report dropped just 1% in this week's report. Weather threats to the U.S. crop are very limited at this point in the season, so the path of least resistance, at least at the present time, seems to be to the downside. Yesterday's close had December corn three cents lower at 404 and one quarter per bushel. Soybeans couldn't find anything positive from Monday's crop ratings, and the soybean market was technically technically overbought. So yesterday's market slide lower ahead of the USDA's report on Thursday really was not much of a surprise. What traders were surprised by was that the USDA left soybean conditions unchanged in this last week's report. Given the dry finish to the season, many thought that we could see the conditions re report to show a decrease in conditions, but that was not the case and the bullish camp was left disappointed. As a result of that disappointment, November beans were 20 and three quarter cents lower at 9.97 and a quarter. Wheat was the lone positive in the grain market yesterday, it grabbed its strength from reports out of Russia and dry conditions here in the U.S. Traders seem especially focused on the Russian wheat harvest, where we're seeing lower than expected yields, and it looks like total production ideas are also slipping. Minneapolis December wheat was three and a quarter cents higher at 6.10. Kansas City rose by eight and a quarter cents to close at 5.84. And Chicago was five and three quarter cents higher at 5.74 and a quarter. Cotton futures continued just sliding sideways. The closing bell December futures were 52 points higher as they 
settle at 68.21. Livestock futures had a mixed session. October live cattle were 60 cents lower at $176.32.5 per hundredweight. October feeder cattle rose by 67.5 cents, settling at $235.40 per hundred. And October lean hog futures dropped by 25 cents, closing out today at $78.55 per hundredweight. Class 3 milk futures absolutely exploded to a new life of contract high. In fact, the last time spot futures were this high was in June of 2022. October closed up 40 points at 23.94. This has been Craig Haugard with your Financial Issues Ag Update. We'll be right back with more financial issues after this. That's Craig Haugard, folks, with the Ag Report. Let's turn now to the equity markets and see what is going on in this chaotic month of September. So yesterday, the markets were kind of unsure of themselves. Uh, the a relative uncertainty of September uh, did continue yesterday. Uh, by midday, major ind- indices were mixed. They netted a positive yesterday. So by the closing bell, the Dow was the only negative. It was down about a quarter percent. The S&P 500 finished almost a half percent in the positive, And the NASDAQ was approaching a full percentage point in the positive there. So relatively good finish for the markets. The pre-markets uh, somewhat mixed today, and the markets have opened now about almost a half hour ago. Uh, pretty negative, at least in terms of the Dow, down over a full percent. The S&P 500 is down six-tenths, and the NASDAQ is barely below the flat line as of right now. So a headline I wanted to share with you all here, folks, uh, NVIDIA. So apparently the most prominent impact on the stock the stock market may be behind us after all. There are a growing number of Wall Street strategists that are saying that NVIDIA's major impact on the stock market is fading. Uh, investors were not impressed by the stock's most recent earnings report. If you remember, we talked about that, I believe it was two weeks ago, caused it to drop by roughly 6%. Uh, the S&P 500 closed flat that day, indicating that the negative sentiment did not permeate through the market. And for the second consecutive quarter, the S&P 500 as a whole did not move in tandem with NVIDIA after its earnings announcement. Folks, I actually think this could be a good thing. I think it's never good for the markets to be beholden to one particular darling company, as we've seen NVIDIA uh, kind of be that. So I think this could be a good trajectory here. You know, we'll have to see. Uh, there was one more headline I wanted to share with you all. A uh, number of ER visits are significantly higher for women who use the abortion pill. This is no surprise to us because we know that the abortion pill is not only fatally harmful for the baby, but also incredibly harmful for the woman. Uh, but those who promote it will not tell you that, of course. So women who visit uh, emergency rooms after taking the abortion pill are more likely to be seen for serious medical problems than women whose pregnancies end with surgical abortions or live births. A study found between 2004 and 2015, 75% of women who went to ERs after taking the abortion pill were rated as severe or critical. Now, Planned Parenthood claims that uh, medication abortion is very safe, that serious complications are rare. That is obviously not true. That is a lie. Uh, There have been several experts who have uh, said that this is, in fact, not true. Uh, And folks, this is why preborn is so important, because preborn is doing everything Planned Parenthood claims to do, uh, except they're actually helping women and they're actually saving babies. So uh, we love Preborn and Preborn is such a faithful partner of financial issues. So you got to check them out. Visit them at preborn.com. That's preborn.com. We had a quick comment I wanted to get to from yesterday here. John was asking only three out of 10 uh, Christians vote and was wondering why. John, that's a great question. Um, I don't know the specifics of the claim. I saw some differing numbers that maybe said it could have been a little higher or even a little lower. But nonetheless, the point stands that not enough Christians vote. And I would implore every Christian listening to this show to please uh, do so. Please do vote. Many pastors claim to be apolitical. A lot of them say they try to try to stay out of politics. They take a middle ground issue. Honestly, before I came to financial issues, sometimes I erroneously confess this too. I was almost thinking I was kind of hyper spiritual by saying, "Oh yeah, you know, I'm above politics. I'm I'm in the middle. You know, I'm in the middle ground." I think that's a bunch of gobbledygook. Uh, I think Christians must vote, and they must vote according to. Uh, number one to the word of God, number two to their conscience, which is to be held captive to the word of God. So vote according to what the word of God says. Um, The Christian who sits by and doesn't vote is like a father who watches a burglar break into his home and harm his family and he does nothing. We need to stand and we need to fight for our country and for our home. We put our hope in our heavenly home, absolutely. But right now God has given us a place to steward and Christians need to steward, steward it well. So I would encourage you all to do that today. Boy, busy show, crazy show today. Remember, the Lord is on the throne, folks. Hopefully that can be of great comfort to you. 
today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. God willing, we'll be back again tomorrow for more financial issues. It's all his. Let's be found good and faithful stewards with what God has given to us. See you then. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Thank you for joining us. This has been an FISM production.